has said that there's a real threat that Russia could use chemical weapons against Ukraine. He will meet NATO, G7 and EU leaders on his four-day trip. Kurt Volker is a former U.S. ambassador to NATO. He's currently a distinguished fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Ambassador Volker, good to have you with us on the program, and you join us from uh, Washington, D.C. via Zoom. Can we just begin with how much hard bargaining is expected to be undertaken by the U.S. president? Because he's got to try and gauge, hasn't he, how NATO and the EU position on Ukraine can become one. Um, well, I think there's a high degree of unity already. I wouldn't say it's hard bargaining. Uh, I think that in terms of sanctions with the European Union, there's a great deal of unity about pursuing the existing sanctions, tightening up the implementation, and then there'll be a discussion about sanctions on uh, Russian energy exports as well, uh, which I think will make some progress, although more needs to be made. At NATO, again, a high degree of unity about defense of NATO territory and reinforcement of allies in the East. Uh, what is unclear is exactly what they will be saying about Ukraine's independence and sovereignty, whether that is a core interest of NATO and what NATO is prepared to do about it, other than continue to provide assistance on an individual basis. I'm sure that will come out perhaps in the final communique. So in terms of sanctions, you know, uh, many European states have over the last few days we've been hearing saying they've done as much as they possibly can, i.e. Germany, perhaps others saying they can do more. Uh, what's your take on what more can be done and is fuel the real center point or the focus that uh, should be pushed you might say by president biden yeah. well absolutely more can be done and the energy sector is ground zero for this uh, russia is still getting about a billion dollars a day in revenue from the world for its oil and gas exports uh, europe shutting this off as soon as possible can make a big dent in that russian income in addition to that, there are now already examples of how uh, sanctions have been avoided by Russia or are, are trying to be avoided by Russia. And those loopholes need to be closed. And that's a form of secondary sanctions against entities that collaborate with Russia in order to uh, avoid falling under those sanctions. So that's another area that needs to be picked up. Mm. Um, finally, I think the financial sanctions that have been put in place against Russian banks have been quite effective. Uh, and yet they are also trying to then use secondary banks or external organizations to receive payments, make payments. Uh, even the United States Treasury facilitated one of these in terms of paying off uh, interest on a Russian debt. Uh, these are areas that need to be tightened up as well. Okay. Can I also talk to you just about the tactics being used diplomatically? Because no sooner are the US uh, and EU talking about sanctions or a certain point of view about how to deal with Ukraine, but then we get Minister Lavrov, and I'm going to quote here through a, a translation that we have talking about NATO and saying that uh, uh, if NATO agrees with a Polish proposal to deploy peacekeepers to Ukraine, the move could trigger a military conflict between the US-led bloc and Moscow. He's alluded to the same issue, should more troops be deployed to the Baltic states. And then we have this other point, which is, uh, has been denied uh, by some uh, in, in Russia, that the potential for nuclear armaments to be used in this conflict, they are, uh, it's a, it, they're changing parameters that both the EU and the US has to deal with while they also deal with the financial implications of sanctions. Right. So uh, these are great examples that you brought up. Uh, the Russians are never saying what is actually the case. And Lavrov is a, a gifted uh, spokesperson on behalf of Russia in terms of selling propaganda and misinformation and misleading. Whenever you hear a Russian statement like this, you need to ask yourself, why are they saying it? And the reason that he is warning off NATO in all of these different ways is because that's what they most fear. Uh, they really don't want to face any kind of NATO country intervention in the war. They're having a hard enough time as it is dealing with the Ukrainian military. They're, after an initial invasion, they're losing ground again, um, having a hard time sustaining their forces. The last thing they want is NATO to be more active in helping Ukrainians. That's why they're making all of these warnings. Ambassador Volker, it's good, all, good to speak to you as always. Thank you very much for joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much.